Hello there. Welcome back. Uh, I'm Lisa Chamberlain. I'm a professor of pediatrics, a uh, longtime community pediatrician and community engaged researcher. So excited to be here today. We have been counting down the days, not only uh, for the topic, but to all be together again. Uh, so welcome back now to our community engaged research session part two. Um, our next presenter is a national leader in public health and in the application of evidence-based research as it pertains to health policy. Please allow me to introduce Dr. Alonzo Plow, who is the Vice President of Research Evaluation Learning and the Chief Science Officer at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Dr. Plow. Thank you. Okay. Great. I've heard this is the right place to stand for the, okay. Because I was worrying, I kind of wander when I talk. If I was up on the stage, I, I was going to wander off. So Great. excellent to be here. Um, really happy to see the work that you're doing. Had a chance to spend uh, time at dinner and in the afternoon with some of the junior investigators. So again, so, so excited about the path that you are on here at Stanford and particularly the work of the Institute. So in this like really too long title um, uh, uh, to this slide, uh, the reason it's long is, and I think this is really following from everything that came before me, we, um, if we are going to address the kinds of structural problems that we're talking about, it requires a deep reconsideration and invest, re, re, re look at our way, way we think about data, research methodologies, and really build in, and not just as, as an aside, but as an intrinsic part, community engagement which I will redundantly keep referring to as community power, and I'll specify what I mean by that, uh, it, as we kind of re reconstruct our approach to research to address these problems that we all recognize. Um, if they would have been solved by some of our conventional academic disciplinary bound problems, they would have been solved by now. But because they have not been, I think that's why it is incumbent on us to think about these changes. I'm going to base some of this on, and anything, everything I'm saying is on the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation website, rwjf.org. I think you all know RWJF. We're the largest uh, private philanthropy funder of, of, of health, uh, celebrating our 50th year. Um, a lot of it's going to come out of this National Commission on, for an equity-centered data system, which, is, uh, which we launched last year. But it's really a kind of a guide recommendation to how we kind of transform the way we think about what are meaningful information to drive the kind of community-led changes we have to make to address these structural factors. I'm going to start out, and I'm glad um, the framing of racism now with the previous presentations, uh, the, the ice has been broken on the need to talk about this very directly, and particularly in the way Eliseo talked about it as structural racism. And, that, and when I talk about particularly what we're doing at Robert Johnson Foundation and the approaches we're taking, it is about structural racism. This um, statement from, from Dr. Walensky really represents another thing Eliseo talked about an awareness that came out of the kind of co-occurrence of the COVID pandemic, the George Floyd murder, which speaks to the endemic of racism, that confluence of a pandemic and endemic racism is what gave us uh, the, the kind of problems we saw compounding during COVID and really represent why belatedly uh, these issues um, have kind of risen to the fore. So how do we confront this as researchers? I'm really pleased that I'm still on the researcher side of this presentation. I'll say, I'll say, you're a funder now. I said, well, I used to be a researcher, so I'm really glad that somebody <laughs> believes that I still have those chops. Um, but uh, what, what, what is, that's a real call to action. All of what you've heard uh, from Sensei, who brilliantly linked the experiential to, to, the, to the statistical, to Eliseo, who gave us all of the data we needed to see on the evidence base that disparities are an issue, what do we have to do as researchers? What do we have to do? Um, I always talk about e examining our methodological canons. I use this come from religion, right? You don't question these things, right? You don't, but we have to question them. We have to question those things that we take for granted about what we call excellent methodology and, and put them to the test around whether they help us resolve the kind of issues we've been talking about today. So for us at the foundation, it's been going beyond social determinants to what are these structural factors, other marginalizing factors, factors 
of, of, of identity that are unfair and create unfair outcomes for people. Um, how do you interrogate these conventional approaches to data construction and definition? It's not that we throw out all of that, what we're trained to do, but how do we look at it and find out what is that right transdisciplinary mix that allows us to address the kinds of problems we've been talking about today and that the Institute is trying to look at? I will come back and forth on meaningful and actionable information, information that drives of awareness and action. Why do we do research? Yeah, we do it for publication. We do it to build knowledge. But we actually do it to change systems to improve outcomes, which can only be influenced by systems change. So I'm going to really be focusing on systems change, population health, and, and the belief that the innovation and broader use of community-engaged research is going to be uh, essential to that. Again, not as some stand-aside piece, but an intrinsic part where when all of you younger investigators are, are mid-career, uh, that'll just be part of what you think about is research. Any good research has a deep community and, and, and partner engaged component. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the recommendation of the National Commission. I will suggest you look uh, on our website to look at more. I'm going to talk about how community partnered knowledge development, which is how we talk about it at the foundation, community partnered knowledge development improves research and our practice. I'm a public health practitioner, short, very, very short time philanthropist, very, very long time um, public health running Seattle King County, Los Angeles, Boston Public Health Department. So much of what I'm presenting today is from very on the ground work that from, from that longer part of my career. Some examples of what we've been doing at RWGF around partnered uh, knowledge building and learning and some future directions. But again, you can see all of this on our website. A little bit on the, on the commission report, and really important document, uh, really interesting group of people who put this together, associate dean at uh, Howard University Medical School, Michael, Karen DeSalvo, Google Health, uh, a New York health commissioner, Act Javier, activist in disability rights. What does it mean to have an equity and even justice-oriented population data system that drives us toward equity and justice-oriented solutions? Uh, the default systems are not that way. COVID showed us how they are imbalanced in terms of national versus hyper-local. And when you start talking about hyper-local, that's when you get to the necessity of community engagement. I'll come back to that. But that commission, that commission report, and the grant making we've been doing related to that, and the partnering we've been doing with CDC and other funders, is a call to action around changing the way we think about what is actionable information, what is the kind of research that is going to produce that, uh, and there's a kind of a call to call to action for a variety of, the, of sectors in that report, um, and I'm going to focus a little bit more on academic and research uh, here. Many, many recommendations, but this number three that came out of this one, the commission was chaired by Gail Christopher, formerly of the Kellogg Foundation, um, and um, ensuring that public health measurement, I think indicators here, uh, captures and addresses structural racism and other inequality. So it's this really, the, the, the recommendations invest in community-led, community-directed, uh, measures understanding of these structural factors, upstream causes of inequity. How do we understand this better? How do we understand how these systems really reinforce segregation, discrimination, and exclusion? What does it mean for researchers to deal with this? Um, this is a movement from, this is, and, and the foundation's research, and I hope, uh, I know some of you are already funded by us. Um, we are trying to work on those social determinants from a health perspective. Um, so, so a lot of what we're talking about is if the social determinants are, you know, pick your interpretation of the pie chart, 80%, 90% of what drives health outcomes, how do we as health informed people work on those social determinants in community partnered context to try to make a difference? What does that mean for researchers? Maybe we can talk about that in the Q&A. Is that where it wanted to be? Yeah, okay. So let me talk a little bit about, a little about community-based participatory research. But I, I'm a little nervous kind of going before you since you are, <laughs> uh, uh, you, you know, I've learned what I know from you and Mary. But, uh, it, uh, but you know, how is community-based participatory research really changing? Uh, and I think, you know, the field, and we use this approach a lot at the found, it's about 
knowledge generation, and it's about generating a kind of actionable knowledge. It just does not come out of our default clinical epidemiologic research. I wasn't trained in anything as a very quantitative uh, epidemiolo epidemiologist doing mathematical models of end-stage renal disease about this. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, this is adjunct necessary knowledge about what it means to address these structural determinants of health. So CP uh, CBPR is part of that. Community engaged and directed, you heard that from our colleague at PCORI. Uh, building and strengthening community, another definition of community power. Uh, knowledge mobilization, building community power, again, that is uh, engagement on uh, steroids, though we don't like to advocate the use of steroids, but, 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 but it's amped up. <laughs> Community engagement amped up. Um, um, leading to action. Why do we do research if it doesn't lead to action? Like all of you, I like publishing. I really like seeing my uh, uh, being part of things in high impact journals. But you want to have action based on that to address the systemic factors that lead to the problems that we're trying to work on. So CBPR is really important in, in a way of thinking about joint, collaborative, uh, authentic, engaged work uh, that, that helps us understand how to address these issues. Better knowledge for better action for better systemic change. And, and when you listen to communities, and we're talking a lot about MCH here, we learned a lot uh, while over the last couple of years uh, on a large ongoing initiative which started out as um, maternal um, morbi mor morbidity and mortality gaps. But our community partners said the better way you think about this is birth justice, birth justice. When you frame it as birth justice, you open up the inquiry to all of those factors, culture, history, the ones that uh, Eliseo had on his slide that have got to be admissible to the research process because those are the leverage points for the changes we want to make. So we talk about community power building versus engagement. And you will see this uh, as, as a movement um, that is, is, I think, transforming the way we have thought about community-based participatory research uh, traditionally. So this shift to, again, community-led research uh, initiated and held outside of our traditional academic boundaries in, in collaboration with us uh, uh, as academics, but we really need uh, to support a kind of CPPR that allows an a autonomy and uh, space for uh, community folks to define uh, the problematic. Again, birth justice, which, uh, which is an affirmative path versus maternal and child health morbidi morbidity, which is a marginalizing uh, uh, construct. Um, so uh, very, language is important. Busy chart, uh, I'll share if it's okay with the um, organizers, you can share my slides with anybody here so you don't have to read all of this one. But when you think about an explore, exploratory framework for community-led research, I mean, these are some of the things that, that seem to be really important. Uh, I'm sure Dean you know, will talk about more about this, but you know, centering on the people most impacted, people who experience the problems, uh, language justice principles throughout the project. Uh, um, the communities that we work with, and you know this, are, have experienced all kinds of multi-generational trauma related to all the factors LSEO talked about. Uh, 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 redlining, uh, whose neighborhoods did interstate highways go through? Why was it my neighborhood in Kansas City that the interstate highway bifurcated the black community? These are non-random non events that have historical and multiplier implications across generations. So you recognize that in trauma-informed dialogue. Uh, acknowledging and addressing that history, co-creation agreements. We talked a lot in, uh, yesterday at the afternoon discussion with the, some of the younger investigators, the, how you develop these governing things, equity frame, all of that. So this is very much how we see that changing. So this shift to racial justice, absolutely critical. Um, funders are changing. I think if you had talked to uh, Alceo and me and our PCORI, PCORI colleague, five years ago, I don't think we would have said the same things we said today. Uh, I think there is a change in what we're doing, a lot of, of, of change, particularly on the philanthropic side, 
Uh, I mentioned a couple of different funding networks, the Transforming Evidence Funders Network, uh, the Funders Learning Group for Action. I love it. It's called the Nerd Herd. Um, you know, you might want to join the Nerd Herd. Um, but again, rethinking how we can get our methodologies to be uh, more aligned with the objectives we're trying to do in Pew and WT Grant Foundation. And if anything, we're trying to do at our WJF is be a catalyst, a good, positive, disruptive catalyst for this change in the way we do the research. Uh, I'm getting toward the end. I'm looking at the clock. Uh, we have to really uh, look at these canons. Uh, academia cannot be the exclusive domain where knowledge is formalized and validated. We have an entire agenda that we call working and transforming academic journals. We have done tremendous work with health affairs, which is a different health affairs than it was. Uh, in terms of the what they consider still rigorous, still highly impact. You, there's no trade-offs between this kind of research and rigor. There's just better understanding to influence the problems we want to under, understand. We're working with Academic Pediatrics uh, Journal on a similar path, American Journal of Public Health. If we don't uh, change the journals, your great community-based participatory research won't get published, okay, because you, right, you know that. Uh, <laughs> um, Underrepresented researchers need to be supported through mentorship, and, and that, that gets to the EDI mandates within uh, our, our, our programs. And again, non-traditional forms should be, research should be funded. I'll just quickly run through this. With CDC, we're doing a lot of this work around the country uh, around, equ around equitable data and community-based participation. This one I'll talk to a little bit more. We are working with a network of virtually all of the HBCUs that will be in the Gulf states around community uh, partnered research to better connect uh, those researchers, communities working on environmental justice um, uh, throughout all the Gulf states. That's in collaboration with the National Academies program that has the big Gulf oil settlement dollars. So uh, that's, that's a 30 year uh, activity across the Gulf South. This application's over. This is our moder uh, the modernized anti-racist data ecosystem model. Uh, we do this in partnership with the De Beaumont Foundation. Uh, CDC's involved with us in that, and um, much of localized public health. This is, but this will be a community organization-led um, projects that really reconceptualize development of meaningful data and research at a community level in, in five places around the country. We had oh, got 400 applications from community-based organizations. We're sorting that through now. The good news is lots of community groups are thinking about and want to be involved in this kind of work. Really, I'm um, over time, but uh, um, since I'm a funder, I know you want to know what we're funding. So <laughs> Health Equity Scholars for Action, under re underrepresented young early career investigators, 15 will be selected every year connected with all of our research programs, given uh, uh, independent research funding, a uh, major piece that we're trying to do. Uh, transforming Academia for Equity, we started with seven schools, public health schools, and the Association of Public Health Schools to create a learning community about what does it mean to change health sciences education uh, in, a, in a more equitable way. So we have working with the schools in a learning community and with their accrediting body to, to make some changes there. And then the Partners for Advancing Health Equity, that's a, uh, a learning a national learning health equity uh, learning collaborative based at uh, Tulane, which is really to help us build this collective field of health equity as funders, researchers, community folks. Uh, I'm, you know, uh, my staff always told me I ended on a downbeat on my talk, so I've, this, is, this is my upbeat slide. Uh, that there are, there, are, there are a lot of, I mean, if you're, you are, are doing a lot of community work, there's a lot of good stuff going on. A lot of committed, even local governments. We have a lot of work at the local level because there's so much commitment. Uh, more trust and transparency. We're working with a lot of hospital systems that are really engaged in how they do this work better. Um, a lot of different cross-sector collaborations. I mean, I think the, there is much going on that I think uh, represents fertile ground, and it seems like you were doing a lot of that work at Stanford, and really a lot of room, particularly for institutions like Stanford, to play a role and, and, and be leaders in this. Um, go to our website. These are how we do our major investigator-driven research programs. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll just uh, open calls all around this kind of research. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Plough.
Amazing. And thank you to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Your leadership has been just unbelievable over the last 20 years. You've really changed our, our lexicon around all of this. It is such a pleasure to introduce uh, our final speaker for this uh, session. Uh, uh, Dr. Nina Wallerstein has been leading this work for all over 30 years. My entire career I have admired and, and relied on her wisdom and work. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Please join me in welcoming Nina Wallerstein, the director of the Center for Participatory Research at the University of New Mexico. Thank you, Lisa. So can you hear me? Is this, it's working, okay. So I'm really pleased to be the investigator here, um, though I, I, of course, recognize Eliseo, Alonso, and even, and since he has investigators, Nikhil has investigators, but just myself, not a funder, not anything else, but kind of trying to be an activist scholar, and what does that mean? And I wanted to just share a little bit of my journey from individual CBPR projects to now looking at institutional change, and institutional change of academia, and institutional change of how research is conducted in, and kind of following on Alonso saying that your last kind of slide of having academic uh, institutions also needing to change for health equity. So my journey started in working in tribal research with, and this is one effort I've been working with since probably 20, 25 years, family listening program. It's an intergenerational, this is probably my one MCH credentials that I work with children at late elementary school kids, their parents and elders in co-creating a culturally centered dinner-based program that really came from the cultural and historical knowledge of the tribes with adolescent and then early child, earlier children um, kind of prevention knowledge where we bred together in a hybrid way a program that could construct together. Now we're expanding, we're getting a lot of other tribal communities looking at us and we're expanding to other DNI efforts. Um, I also wanted to honor a kind of a lot of learning I've had from Latin America. Paulo Freire became a mentor to me in the 70s, actually. I was working in an adult education program in San Jose, California, and then started working on co-creating with the Pan American Health Organization an entire training curriculum on empowerment, health promotion, and it moved into participatory research and health promotion and empowerment. Um, and in Brazil, I've had this opportunity of working with this network now where we are sharing projects all over the country through a training program where people, the midwives in the Amazons are talking to the kids on the street in Sao Paulo and the homeless talking to the women in the favelas in Rio. And I'm now trying to reintegrate this test of this network idea through training and co-learning, collaborative learning in New Mexico. So not just that all of my CBPR work that I do academically, it's just one thing, but how can we make it practical? Bring it down, working with coalitions. I work with health councils in New Mexico, working with promotores and health. Um, um, so I'm trying to kind of always think, I guess, thank you, Alonso. I'm always thinking of action, action, action. How do we make this really work? And so uh, this is kind of, we've had a couple years of Zoom, of training in Brazil. I'm going back to Brazil actually in February, but training in Zoom. So this is Google Jamboard trying to bring together a vision from, this is a tribal indigenous leader group in Brazil from leaders all over the country, able to come together through Zoom to kind of construct together their vision of what they wanted to see. So I want to talk to you today about Engage for Equity, which has been this 16, 17 year program research agenda started with NIMHD funding, thank you very much, Eliseo, um, through the NARCH effort of tribal directed research, where then we got a pilot funding to develop a model, do the research into the literature. What is driving community engagement? Trying to bring a science to community engagement. We then got extra funding in stage two to develop the model further, develop measures, test it, and identify ways to measure our partnering so that we could, in fact, see what makes a difference. Not every engagement works. What is it? What are the best practices that need to come? Stage three, we're just at the end of, we refined our instruments, we, do, we translated them into Spanish, we then have been testing them. We've been able to test and work with 400 federally funded academic research partnerships across the country to, to look at what are the best practices across the country. And then stage four, PCORI engagement grant working, and I've had the great pleasure of working with Stanford um, and in a collaborative engagement with Stanford, um, Morehouse, HBCU in Atlanta, and um, the Fred Hutch 
University of Washington Cancer Consortium, very, very different institutions, but together thinking, what do we need to do to change institutions to sustain community, and I'll use Alonso's words, community-driven research um, rather than community just engaged, or community-powered research rather than just community-engaged research. So of course, I don't know if you've seen this, it's a, our very busy model, it's to me, in many ways, my, this is my life story in one page, but this is kind of um, where you can see that we try to capture in a dense way the literature around what matters in community-engaged research. It really is simply four domains. It says context matters, local, national, regional context, political context. That is then influenced by the partnerships that get created to address the context. Whatever the MCH context is, whether you call it birth justice, you know, in that context, or, or the morbidity, mortalities around um, disparities related to different populations, those contexts matter. But it's really who's going to do the work around it. Who are the partners that get brought together to actually make a difference? Researchers, in our case, community members, patients, advocates, and funders, et cetera. That partnership, if it's working, drives all the actions. It's not somebody sitting in their institution and saying, I'm going to create the research design and the research question myself. It's the partnerships that drive the actions, whether, and I'm an intervention researcher, so I put interventions there, but drive the research design, drive all of the engagement. And then if you're driving the actions by partnered processes, then the outcomes are not just what your grant funded for. The outcomes become much bigger. They become capacity outcomes, system change outcomes, policy outcomes, sustainable partnership outcomes. They, became, they become social justice outcomes. You may be funded for diabetes management, or you may be funded for a cancer survivorship, or you may be funded for whatever you're funded for, but the outcomes in partnering grow. And so this is a simple pathway model. You can forget my dense literature-based one that embodies my whole life. So um, we've created this Engage for Equity Toolkit. Thanks, Cincy, for also bringing her own tools to this. This is a, a, a website that's been created to look at resources that are tools, training tools. I've used them now in Brazil. They're, they're translated into Portuguese and Spanish and English. This is a purely English website, but all of the tools actually are now translated into other languages and I work with them. But these are different kind of tools to have partners together come and say, how do we look at our history? We use a river of life to look at histories, to look at community knowledge systems, to look at the journey of a partnership. We use the visioning with the CBPR model to actually create a desired set of outcomes together where projects can do that. So we've been, and then we have these validated survey instruments. It's all available on the website. You can see if it makes sense to you. Um, just a few kind of slides of where we were at the project level before we jumped up to the institution level. But at the project level, we did identify a set of promising practices or best practices. Obviously, the, community, the one in yellow, Community Engaged in Research Action, it's an index that originally came from Dmitry Koryokov from RAND and UCLA. But we added also new metrics related to the action at the community level as a result of having these research results. It was initially just, you know, was the community involved in design, community design in starting the research process, community design in collecting data, community involved in an analysis of data. But we added, and so this index or a set of metrics that we have is associated with better health outcomes if the community is involved. There's evidence that community engagement matters in terms of outcomes. Written agreements are helpful. That means that instead of just relying on trust and dialogue, let's have shared accountability together. Partners having shared accountability. And this kind of construct that got created, or we were able to bring it together statistically, commitment to community collective empowerment. I'll talk about that. This is what it is. Commitment to collective empowerment brings together four constructs. This is across our 400 partnerships across the country that we share a set of principles, whether they're, you call them CBPR principles or participatory principles, they're shared across the team. 
that people in the team believe they have influence, decision-making power in making the decisions as a team, it fits with the local knowledge. That's the local histories, knowledge bases. It's not just academic. It fits with the local knowledge of whatever your community is. And that you engage together in collective reflection on equity and on your own processes, evaluation. So together, statistically, we then brought this together and called that. That is commitment to collective empowerment. And you can see in our latest publication that commitment to collective empowerment is a key driving force for outcomes. It matters in terms of the relationships and the synergy of a team. It matters in terms of the community engaged in research actions. And it's also bound or uh, complementary to structural co-governance where the, that is where community partnerships have agreements together. They share resources and they share budget. Big difference, they share budget. That is the proxy for shared power, the shared budget. So all of this leads to then outcomes that again are social justice outcomes, but also outcomes related to the particular health issue of your grant or research process. So we're now really excited that we can say power matters, whether you call it, we called it commitment to collective empowerment, but this is a driving force to uh, successful projects that are community engaged. So despite all of this wonderful work, we said this doesn't matter enough because there's still individual projects cannot do it alone. You have to have these institutions supporting. How do you create the structures within a university that would support people not as individuals but as a commitment to a community? There's obviously ongoing distrust by, in academic health centers by community members. And for our case, we said we haven't really tested the engagement strategies that work to make the changes at the institutional level, which is, you know, I'll just say there's a lot of examples in the structural racism realm of, of institutional racism. Our academic health centers are filled with institutional racism and not serving the communities around us. So then we wanted to begin to move to challenge three and four, where you said that we don't know the interventions that work and how do we make the changes that will also interact with individual CAPs or community academic partnerships. So it's not just changing maybe tenure and promotion mechanisms at a university system. It's also how do the individual, those changes impact then researchers being able to do their work on the ground in the research that they apply for. So we got this initial PCORI engagement grant, as I mentioned. We were going to learn how to conduct an institutional assessment. We tested a whole survey instrument. Thank you, Stanford, for participating with us. And also the feasibility of implementing these, this kind of these, we call it E squared is engaged for equity. E squared plus workshops are tools we were able to do with maybe some of you in the room. I know some of you in the room, but maybe others that I don't know. Um, and began to create this co collaborative community of practice with these three institutions that are very, very different. Um, and so what is our approach? We have the coaching of champion teams, workshops. We use da data is critically important for advocacy. We had qualitative data, interviews, focus groups, uh, you know, interviews with leaders, and also focus groups with community partners, focus groups with investigators, focus groups. Um, and, we then, and we also did our institution, our quantitative survey brought that together and began to create a multi-site community of practice. This is, a, just, this is one river of life um, that we came together. Again, this is all virtual. We had to do it over Zoom. But it was a lot of fun to realize we could create dialogue over Zoom in a good way with some visual tools that brought it home. It's not just a kind of empty dialogue. So our learnings in many ways, that, that, that there's wide variation in each institution in terms of their starting point. And there's still a dominance of T1 and T2 funding, or the current best, you know, you know, the moonshot of whatever it is. You know, what is it that we're going to do? And it's very hard to move and give highest status to community-engaged research. It's, it's just a challenge institutionally. So the external funders are critically important. Thank you, PCORI. Thank you, NIMHD. Thank you, RWJ. To shift, and, and as Alonso was saying, maybe funders have shifted. Um, you know, and that even though health equity and the structural racism because of the George Floyd murder, murder is more now recognized under COVID, 
there's so many administrative and financial barriers to doing community-engaged research at the institution level. And the fact is that there's a growth in some DEI efforts, especially around training and uh, pipeline, but that's often divorced from community and patient engagement. And we really need it to come together and say it's one and the same thing. And even though institutions believe they are changing, community partners do not believe that. So it's really important to recognize that community partners still experience exclusion. And you know, I know I'm maybe I'm walking into some fine ground here, but you know, just the fact that um, you know, the Stanford Medical Center does not provide access to all Medicaid patients is very much an institutional racist barrier to also doing good research in community engagement where the Stanford is believed to be welcoming all of its populations that live around um, its catchment area. So this is an institutional racism dimension that needs to be somehow addressed, hopefully, by all of you. You get here, you know, it's, policies are there not to protect the community, but to protect the university. They have to make sure the community feels that they really want to hear their voices and are not just putting on a show. And they need to give them appropriate compensation for the engagement of their time and their expertise. So one of the things has to do, and I know Stanford has been very good at this, is trying to say, we're going to look at post-award. We're going to look at giving people really good compensation. We're going to see if there's even possibility to change how post-award works so that people, community partners, can actually get advances on, I don't know what you actually are going to end up doing, but this is not just Stanford. It's every academic institution in the country is really having a difficult time creating financial equity with co-researcher partners. It's not, again, just Stanford. We're founded at Morehouse even, which where they was founded in the leadership at Morehouse. We interviewed the president of Morehouse who said, equity is in our DNA. It's in our history. It's how we started. But even at Morehouse, they have difficulty fin financing their community partners. It's an administrative barrier that just confronts us all. Um, there are some examples of change in this process. New Office of Patient Engagement at Fred Hutch, incremental institutional changes through IRBs, et cetera. Though there's now effort at the national level to look at maybe changing IRB efforts to say what else does any institution have to do so that I, that would demonstrate benefit to community, not just um, uh, benefit to risk benefit individual ratios in IRB. A lot of trainings planned, um, expanding to other diverse partners, recognition of the need for long term commitment. We've all been talking about that. And what is the word where it's being thrown around all around now? Institutional trustworthiness. What does that really mean if you have these administrative and financial barriers that are baked in you know, institutional racism? So we're now, I'm just going to end with two uh, more slides. We're just ending, we're now, we've worked on this engagement award. We're now applying for the science of engagement. It's the science part of PCORI to test um, our intervention with eight new academic institutions. And we're going to maintain our two-year intervention with the champion teams and workshops and coaching and using data for advocacy. But we're adding in two innovations, which I think is important, also working with actual community projects, research projects, and seeing how they can be influenced with this process, and bringing in much more attention. And it's here, Alonso, even before you said your thing, greater support for community patient agenda setting, for community power, um, where, where we wanted to say, no, how can we support the community partners and patients at these institutions to have separate meetings, separate safe spaces, separate air ways to gain their own advocacy and power to begin to be able to influence the institutions as well with very willing champion teams, which also are composed of also community partners. And these are our aims. We're going to work with champion teams, the institutional level changes, and the PCAP, we've named that patient community active academic partnerships, also kind of this interface and interaction at a multi-level dynamic. And this is our logic model where the ultimate logic, there's no, uh, as Ella said, so there's no way to, but at the, at the patient and community engagement experience, which is the, the PCORI outcomes, where we're looking towards enhanced collective empowerment, enhanced community organizational power, 
and enhanced institutional trustworthiness. Those will be the core outcomes that we're looking for. So I just want to thank you for this opportunity to say, yes, we're trying to move on institutional change. I'm going to hope and continue to work with Stanford over the next years as well. We're going to kind of evolve all of us in an ongoing community of practice. I'm talking to Phil Alberti at AAMC because his efforts in trying to create community of practice of kind of community engaged academic medical centers that are trying to also kind of change institutional practices to actually confront these issues that we all care about and that can support junior investigators to actually do their work in a, in a safer and saner environment. So thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat>